So with no further ado, let's move into the next panel discussion. I'd like to ask Peter Van Cleef, Dave Clare and Paul Rolf to join me here. I know Paul's here. Ah, hiding over there. And there should be Dave Clare somewhere. Dave Clare? No. Dave's obviously given up the ghost. Uh, as Dave was from a company called Solace Systems, we shall solace him later. Um, or console him later. Uh, okay, in-house developments versus off-the-shelf. And that's a long, long discussion that's uh, showing my age, and no doubt Peter from Allianz would be the same. Uh, we've seen come up as a debate throughout, uh, and consistently throughout the ages, build by uh, uh, or outsource. Um, having said that, we're not really going to go into the outsourcing area. It's really to say, should you uh, build or buy? And to find out, let's hear what um, Peter Van Cleef and Paul Rolf have to say about it. Peter's from Lakeview Arbitrage, and Paul's from ThinkSoft Global Services. And to begin with, Peter, uh, build or buy? Okay, well, I think that's a simple answer. Basically, neither one uh, or basically both. <laughs> so that's, that's, I guess, the easy, easy way out question. Um, I guess from what you see today is, uh, and we had some discussion about it yesterday with cloud and new, new technologies and stuff like that, which repeatedly comes up. Uh, that a lot of the new technology uh, that is coming along now is, is slightly different or quite different from what people are used to. You know, you have tons of people that, you know, can write, you know, in Visual Basic, Java, you know, C++. Once you move to hardware, um, you know, probably there's not a lot of people as we've seen yesterday, uh, you know, only two or three guys in the room uh, actually familiar with those technologies on a, on a first-hand experience. Um, so then the issue becomes much more pressing and saying, well, okay, do you really want to build up internal knowledge and know-how? And actually, how do you judge, you know, if people have that know-how, which is difficult. You know, if you get new technologies and then you want to hire new people, I mean, you need to find out, okay, can I actually do the job? Because if you go through three iterations hiring guys, first guy says, okay, yeah, I'm an expert in this, I can do this. And then, you know, six months later, it turns out he can't do it. You just lost six months. And then basically, if, aside from whatever you pay him. And then the next guy comes in and maybe, okay, you learned a lot in the six months, but maybe that decision, again, is not optimal. Uh, so a lot of times what we've seen is that when new technology comes along, a lot of people say, well, for us, traditionally, it's very important to build up know-how internally. Um, and uh, then they go through the iterations. And in the end, it takes six months, a year, and nothing really has happened. And when, if they would have gone out to an external party, uh, that had the expertise, they would have had at least something within three and six months, maybe not the optimal solution, but at least they would have had something and would have had the same experience or the same learning curve, at least a very similar one, uh, doing that. Uh, so when you realize that, I think the, the, the tricky part is to say, okay, where is really critical to have expertise in-house and where it makes sense like to go outside. Uh, from my experience, what I've seen is um, it's not really worthwhile, you know, getting guys in that, that trying to get things done, but really, you know, if, if you enter new technology, new field, a uh, new type of business, to get someone very senior, um, which might be a little bit more expensive, but basically that, you know, has proven he can do it, and then basically, you know, use him as a project manager, and then maybe initially outsource part of it, and then move to building expertise internally, which kind of buys you time because then you're getting in production, you're getting actually results, uh, and you have someone who can manage the process and, and also, you know, someone who can objectively say, okay, if the parties are the outsourcing to actually can deliver and if they're competent, uh, and then I think you will have a reasonable good experience, whereas if you take people on the, you know, entry level or, or mid-level mid and you leave it to them to outsource that, then a lot of times you might, again, get not the right people and you might have, you know, long delays and things because you go through several iterations. So I think as long as you have someone that can determine if the party you're outsourcing to is competent and, and can find the right people, it's a, it's a, it's a very cost-saving, efficient way to do things. Um, and then, you know, you can always decide what you want to do internally. But with a lot of technologies uh, that is base technology, you know, connectivity, um, you know, base infrastructure, uh, I don't think it's really worthwhile uh, a lot of times building in that, that know-how internally, because it's, it's really commodity stuff that changes also. You're building up 
you know, knowledge that in the end is, is worthless, maybe potentially in three to six months because new technology comes along, new connectivity options, new things. So a lot of times on, on the things that it's just the basic plumbing, uh, I think that's something that's, you know, very, very uh, good for, you know, having external parties do for you. Uh, and then focus on really what, what is the key so IP in your business, where, where's really where you make the money. Can I just check, Peter, if I summarize what you just said, um, I think what you're saying is you should build knowledge and talent in the strategic areas of technology and buy in everything else that's commodity. Yeah, and, and if you're buying talent, then I would advise on rather looking for very senior talent, um, people that, you know, seen a lot of things, done, done a lot of things. Uh, so you don't go through iterations there as well, because then, then it really becomes a mess. You know, if you have people that are trying to do something or are interested in something but don't really know how to do it, uh, and then they're outsourcing things to other people who try to do things but not really sure if they can do it and trying it, then, you know, it, it uh, usually leads to unpleasant experience. Mm, sure. Paul, do you agree? Do you, what's your take on this? Um, I don't really think that the technology matters very much, to be honest. Um, I think it's much more about what you build within your business and your understanding of your business and what you're trying to drive there. Um, where you get the technology, whether you take something that's there and adapt it, whether you build it yourself, really doesn't matter. It's the end objective. It's what your users finally get at the end of the day. It's your ability to quickly transact some business because that's what all of this is about. Do you need the... Techno technological understanding within your organization? I don't believe you do. I believe you need a way to translate the business side of your discussion, the business side of what you're driving to achieve, and find a way to translate that using the technology into something that you can put into operation. Yeah, that, 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 that I would partially agree to, but uh, I think, you know, especially with new technology, and that's my experience as well, um, a lot of people now building technology realize that in financial services or, or trading, uh, people have a lot of money to throw away. Um, maybe it doesn't look like that if you look at the share price of banks, but you know, still a lot of money spent on IT. And a lot of people that build stuff for you know, automotive stuff, medical stuff, military stuff, and military, okay, they spend a lot of money as well, but they realize, okay, there's another deep pocket I can, I can dive into, and a lot of stuff you know, you get offers from different companies that virtually offer you the same, and one charges you a quarter of a million, half a million for a proof of concept, and the other ones deliver you a finished product for, let's say, 100,000 euros or pounds. Uh, and you find huge price discrepancies for pretty much virtually the same service and the same offering. And I think to that degree, it's very helpful to have somebody who you know, at least can evaluate that to a degree where he says, well, okay, here I got two proposals, they're virtually the same. This one costs three or four times as much than this one. So which one should we go for? Um, and then also can verify that the guys that offer the same product as a quarter of the price, you know, is that sort of like, um, you know, fantasy or is that, is that really something that they can deliver? And then I think you have, you have a huge opportunity for cost saving and efficiency savings. And I think you, you do need a basic understanding of at least how you want to put things together and what the key questions are to ask. So even if you, if you don't want to, if you say, okay, you don't want to understand the, the technology really deeply, at least you need someone to tell you what the questions are that you need to ask the people to verify, you know, what you're actually getting. Because otherwise, I think if you just leave it to other people, um, there's too much money throw, going around that, uh, you know, people will sell you the world and, and then some and say, this is what you need, this is great, you need that, and, you know, you pay top dollars for it and we give it to you and in the end you will have nothing that works. Absolutely. So it's all about the proof of what it is that the people that you're outsourcing this to... Yeah, and know. what the benefit is for you. Yeah, exactly. what, the, yeah. What, what the benefit is. And it's the requirements at the earliest stage which drive that. If right. the people that you are talking to can demonstrate that they fully understand your requirements, in fact, to the extent that maybe they can bring some requirements to you that you've not even considered, That's of you start to then develop the sort of trust to say to them, now build this for me. And you develop the sort of trust to say, at the end of the day, show me the evidence to say that this maps back to my requirements, that this will actually drive the business that I'm trying to achieve. The piece around technology, yes, you can save money using different types of technology, 
But that's largely unimportant. The big money is that you can make is once you put this into operation. If you put it into operation and it works at a level of quality that drives the business for you, that's what absolutely you need to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm just always a little bit hesitant on saying, well, cost doesn't matter. I mean, you know, I don't know, maybe it's like the size of my organization in comparison to, you know, Deutsche Bank or other guys, but uh, I think a little bit cost consciousness never hurts really no, too much. No, 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 cost <laughs> consciousness by all means, but yeah. quality and value That's for what course. you're getting. One of the uh, lists that you left out was the amount of money that uh, governments <laughs> spend on failed projects, and they throw vast amounts of money at them. Yeah. And yes, uh, the big boys come in and soak up loads and loads and loads of that money and don't actually know and understand the detail of the business proposition behind it. Yeah. Let's step back one second because we're joined by our third panellist who, uh, like the, everyone else on the agenda, thought it was starting at 11.15 and probably didn't realise that uh, we're going to get there early. Um, Dave, do you want to give a quick introduction? Just a summary and recap what we've covered so far is that uh, you should build strategic knowledge internally, particularly senior decision-making knowledge, to interpret and test what you're buying in from the outside, but buy everything that's commodity from the outside is the view. Uh, and what's your take? Yeah, well, as a, as a vendor, we love that view. Um, I'm not sure about the commodity piece because I think um, actually deriving real value will depend on whether you're looking for cutting edge to drive the business or more commoditized stuff, which is run the bank rather than the grow the bank. Um, and um, you know, the, the issue, looking at the actual title, one of the issues that I see is this long-term cost of, of ownership because you build a system. Um, that's only the, the, the entry price. You know, the cost of the life of the, of the actual project and, and the, the life of what you actually build is far greater than, than the initial investment to actually put the thing in place. Um, and, and, and what we see is a constant iteration of projects as they evolve. Uh, and, and actually having a platform as the core, which, um, which is flexible enough to, to achieve you know, variation and, and, and enhancement, is probably one of the things that, that differentiates when you actually buy from a vendor, you probably only use 20 or 30% of the functionality that's available for that, that entire product. Whereas if you would build something in-house, it's quite often you will build just what you need, you know, and then you've got to constantly go back and enhance that as business requirements change. So you know, I think th th there's no easy answer to this. There's, there's always going to be a, a blend of, of in-house and commoditized product from, from additional vendors. Um, I think the other thing that that's probably worth throwing into the pot is the amount of investment that the, event, that the vendors make in their product. You know, so you actually have a wealth of experience uh, and, and functionality that's been developed over a long time that um, you know, you're kind of benefiting from that as a, as a partial investor in that product. You know, you've invested in that product alongside other customers. And um, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the ways of sharing cost of developing. You know, by, by buying from vendors that do have that. Yeah, I think that's, that's an important point that you raised, that uh, that in fact should happen, uh, because I think what, what I see a lot of times is that you're helping the vendor actually to build something that they wouldn't be able to build without your knowledge. And then basically the question is, is that contribution that you're making reflected in the price and the service on the vendor? And there are some vendors where you, know, you provide a lot of input to them, but basically there's no return for that. They basically just take your idea and say, okay, great, mm -hmm. this is fantastic. Now we, we've got all the IP to build a great product, uh, and that is not reflected then in reciprocity to actually the person providing, or the, the, the company or organization providing the IP. So um, what I've seen very successful is you know, when people, almost to the degree of a joint venture, say, okay, fine, you know, here we have someone who has technical expertise in some area where we don't have it, uh, but they don't have the domain expertise, and then you sit together and say, okay, here we contribute the domain expertise, but in return, <laughs> we need some, you know, sort of participation or some, you know, of, um, I guess, uh, reciprocity for us as well, so that it actually works for both sides. And I think that's something uh, you should always look for when you're looking to, to outsource to other people that they're saying, well, okay, uh, either there's someone that actually brings ideas, knowledge to you, which is, of course, is perfect. You know, if you have an outside vendor that says, okay, fine, you want to do this, but I can tell you how to do it much better, cheaper, and, you know, let's do it like this, great. Uh, maybe it doesn't happen 100% of the cases, but um, 
if in the usual case it's like someone has technical expertise but they don't have the domain expertise, then it's still not an objective to, to use them. But then I think you really have to be careful if it's just a one-way street or if it's like a two-way street. Yeah. And then I think you get much better experience if you make sure it's a two-way street, and that's a lot to do, of course, with, with corporate culture and, and policy of the company. I'm fairly sure Dave would say that if they're doing that sort of partnership, you get all the resources at cost. Um, well, <laughs> well, that depends how that that depends how you structure that. Even for for a provider or vendor, uh, sometimes it might make sense to produce something at cost. If then, let's say they have a product that you know they can sell, um, you know, in in the zillions. I mean, that if I, if I get a if, if I'm a product vendor and I have to, to build a product and I get that financed for nothing, basically, uh, for at cost, and then as a product that really sells, I mean, that's fantastic, right? Why, why shouldn't I do that? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something, it, especially on the cutting edge, is something that you know, some people are open to and some people are not open to. And I would be hesitant to work with people that are completely not open to that. I just say, okay, you tell me everything you know. I don't tell you anything I know, but I'm also going to charge you a lot of money for what I know or <laughs> might know. And I think that's, that's, that's tricky, I think. Yeah. So again, you're coming back to its, its domain knowledge, its specialism. It's the full understanding of the business requirement that actually drives yeah. this, this, this whole piece. Um, in terms of buying something off the shelf that's going to fit your organisation, the chances are it's not going to. It's going to have to be adapted. You're going to have to make changes to it. And sometimes the vendor will take advantage of that, um, and not in a bad way, because it will improve their product, give them the ability to resell that elsewhere mm. and use that. And that's right and proper. Um, they will develop experience around that. Mm. But they must be specialists at the beginning to be able to understand that. It may well be that, that to get from London to Edinburgh, uh, the, the, the concept of transport suggests that you might want to buy a Rolls Royce. But if the test is that that's all you need to do, it's probably going to be a lot cheaper going by EasyJet or yeah. buying a Mini and selling mm. it when you get to the other end. Yeah. Um, you need to understand what the purposes are, what the business requirement is. Drive everything from that. And that will tell you, do you develop your Mini, do you buy your Mini in-house and sell it when you get to the other end and yeah. it's cost you next to nothing? I think there's or a do you buy a Rolls Royce because it's your chairman and that's what he yeah. requires to get but from But there's you. a key area here and it's one that occurs to me regularly when I look at investment versus retail commercials uh, and other parts of the fa banking market in particular, is that in capital markets, investment trading, we typically have a lot more tactical investment in technology than in other parts of the financial markets. If it's tactical, it's disposable in my view, and therefore you can buy commodity and then just throw away. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of times renting commodity is, is basically even cheaper, right? I mean, yeah. you, you don't need to buy it because basically then, again, you, you're financing but something that, you know, is obsolete in a couple of months. And that's where industrialization and trading or technology comes in, which really is happening in financial markets today. So if you're sharing costs with other people, then it's much cheaper. I mean, there's even some smaller trading firms that go out and say, okay, uh, you know, this arms race is becoming very expensive. Uh, okay, let's share technology, let's share infrastructure and, you know, bring the costs down that way. And they could as well do that via the vendor or they could basically just do it together. And there's, there's, there's millions of different options to skin the cat. Uh, just another thing I want to add to that, uh, to, to the comment here, I think is, you will also find us there's some vendors that basically do everything themselves. So they, they sell you something and then basically you are at, the, at their mercy. Um, so, uh, you know, only they can services, only they can support it, only they can do modifications. And, and that sometimes is a, is a dangerous lock-in as well, I think. Um, so there's, there's a movement of some companies saying, well, okay, we actually produce a product, but then we have several service organizations that actually service our product and I can do modifications, alterations to it, so you don't have a vendor lock-in. So you can go to one service provider and uh, another sort of like supporting partner and say, okay, can you do this for me? You're not happy with them? Okay, you can go to the next. You're not happy with them? You can go to the next and you have like a choice. Uh, I also think it's reasonably difficult if you're dealing with an organization that says, okay, our stuff is so close and so proprietary, we don't have anybody else supporting our system, our infrastructure, so you never have a choice. So basically, you only have to go back to them. So if you want this button in green instead of blue, okay, you have to go to them and they can charge basically whatever they want because they say, well, okay, if you don't pay this, then we just switch it off. 
uh, or you know we basically you know put it on the shelf and if this is important for you then you don't get it in Q4 but you get it in Q4 but not this year but you know we don't tell you what the year is and if you have external parties supporting that platform and, and if you know the vendors and system providers are a little bit open and that respect that they say okay we actually build an ecosystem around us that we say okay other people can support our product as well and can build maybe even additional functionality which helps then the vendor to sell even more that's that's a really uh, a good thing so i think one one definite question would be on the support side if you go out and, and want to outsource anything to say what i'm buying here you know who aside from you can support that uh, who can help me with if uh, if i have problems you know who can do integration extensions and i think that's an important question as well i Dave, can't speak for, uh, for other vendors but certainly we take the view that if we build something in partnership with a customer and that customer perceives that it gives them real competitive edge then the customer always has the choice to to keep that as a product um, which is not in our direct kind of GA mm. track, it becomes their own version of that product, which is expensive longer term um, because you know you don't get the benefits of, of it rolling into the GA side. Or you know you just say, yeah, we want that putting into the standard product and it will just be supported and maintained going forward. And that has to be the customer's choice. But the, the other thing that I think from our point of view that's interesting is, is when you start to look at some of the more exotic technologies that, that actually have a very high entry point, um, FPGA development is, is our area of specialization, you know, and, and I think, you know, our expertise in, in being able to deliver FPGA solutions, um, you know, can really accelerate what, 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 what customers would like to be doing, but find it very hard themselves. You know, again, that's, that's the balance, that's the partnership, um, and, and you can kind of reduce the entry into some of these very expensive <laughs> clubs by, by using specialists in, in that area. Yeah, I guess where I was leading to with my last d discussion was to say if most of what's in there uh, and in the infrastructure on the trading desks is commodity and tactical, what is the strategic stuff? Well, it's the IP on the strategy, clearly. I mean, what do I do with the technology? You know, what is it good for? I mean, is it actually useful to be, you know, uh, below one millisecond? Uh, does my strategy even require that? Uh, what what actually is my strategy? You know, where 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 am I making the money? I mean, that's a, in a lot of organizations kind of gets lost uh, in the process in terms of deciding. Okay, where do I actually make the money? You know, a lot of the larger organizations they're basically okay. We need the latest greatest of everything, but we don't actually know what we need it for. And I mean, that's that's what I was trying to say in the beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. you need at least some level of understanding at the top that people say, okay, is that actually stuff I need or is that stuff basically everybody talks about and I feel like, okay, everybody has to have it. Um, and is that an IT guy? And what sort of IT guy? Or is it a, a business person? I mean, what sort of talent well, experience do, would you look for in that person? Well, ideally you want to have both and that's a, that's a tricky part. I mean, you, you find very, I mean, still, you know, of course, most of the traders now have some IT knowledge because they have to write strategies and, you know, everybody goes into algo trading, high frequency trading, systematic trading. So a lot of people have, have some IT background, but, uh, you know, that is still on the, on the higher level, it's very difficult to find people that have actual business experience, trading investment management experience and, and have like, IT experience. And I think that's the ideal person you want to have who can put together the business side and, and the IT side, because, of course, I mean, no offense, but, you know, some people might say, well, okay, you know, if, if I'm a mechanic, I mean, maybe it's more pleasurable to work on a Lamborghini and Ferrari. Okay, I just go shopping with it and I just drive to the supermarket with it. Maybe it's not the right car, but, you know, it gives me a lot of pleasure to work with this. And then, you know, people might argue, okay, we need this uh, because, you know, for, the, for that person is great. But in the end, you know, it doesn't really benefit anybody. Um, and, and that's something, I guess, that, that is something definitely you have to do in-house where you have to make the decisions, okay, what is core technology and what is it used for? What is actually the application? And if you, if you don't have that internally, it's very difficult to find outside parties that can advise you on that. I mean, there's now starting to be some people, you know, leaving big banks, uh, being ex-CTO, whatever, that's setting up consultancies because they see, okay, there's a need for it, um, but that's still very thin on the ground. But that's that would be an ideal situation, having either someone like that or having an outside advisory. I mean, a lot of times, what I've seen as well work in, in banks that you go to someone says, okay, this is the CTO of an, a successful organization. Maybe we can rent that knowledge and say, okay, fine. Maybe you can just advise us on that. You know, basically, you know, you don't have to divulge any strategy or whatever you're doing, but you know, maybe you can just give us some hints and say, okay, you know, how should we structure this? And then once you have the structure, then you can go outside and, and build relationships with vendors. And I think that works quite well. So, so it's interesting. So I'm not a trader. I'm not a vendor. Uh, I don't provide solutions. <laughs> All I do is provide evidence. 
Okay. Now, I'm concerned that that evidence relates directly to the business requirement. I don't see that relating to technology at all, apart from that's the nuts and bolts of how you do it. You may be able to do it faster, you may be able to do it quicker. If the requirement is not for that, it doesn't matter. If yeah. the requirement is, it matters enormously. It's about analysing those requirements, understanding that business need, and producing the evidence that what's being delivered at the end of the day is actually what was required. Mm. Yeah, but a lot of times that is difficult. I mean, for example, just uh, one project I was recently working on is um, a bank that wants to restructure their, let's say, quoting for retail products, and then they look at different venues and how they can quote to them, and then basically, you know, you can go to the venues and say, okay, what connection options do you have, and you know how you can deal with it, and then you get an answer. But if you come from a trading side, or if you come from a trading and IT side, you would ask different questions. I mean, if you just ask, okay, what connectivity options you have, and they tell you, okay, this is our standard connectivity, and this is what you get. Then, if you've you know, been in the business for a little bit longer, then they say, well, okay, what alternatives do you have? And then suddenly it turns out that two venues you can connect via the third one, basically saving two connections uh, with exactly the same quality, the same speed, and that they also have another connection option, which you know, is a lot faster than the first one. It's just not many people are taking that. Um, and then, then you get a little bit deeper into that. And that, that's why I'm saying that, you know, but, but these are all the, bells the, the, and whistles you're talking about. Yeah, you're talking about all the, all the pieces that it could possibly do, the ways that it could possibly do it. Yeah, but that's that answers... doesn't matter. It's what it's mm. delivering at the end of the day. Yeah, but... And that's related to the initial requirement, which is purely business. It's not about how you achieve it. It's what you actually want to achieve. Yeah, but what, what I'm trying to say is, like, even if the business has a clear focus and has a clear objective, what they want to achieve, sometimes they don't know the right questions to answer. Exactly and if, if you why you need a specialist you don't to look at that as <laughs> yeah. an independent, to come in there and say, well, this is what we understand you're doing. We've got domain knowledge, yeah? yeah? We work in that area, only um, in that area. <laughs> we come along and we say, this is what you believe you need. This is what we expect you to need. Let's look at those two things together. Let's do this as a partnership yeah, that, no, that and drive it from yeah. there. We've, we've jumped into the black hole area that we, this normally gets into in this discussion. And I'll let Dave make this um, response to the next bit because I regularly write on my blog um, about the language of technology and business and the chasm in between. And uh, it's summarized by if men are from Mars and women, women are from Venus and bankers are from Mercury and techies are from Uranus. And so what I'm trying to get there is how do, how do, you, well, you know, how do you bring that language together where you know, if, if the strategic interpretation of business requirements into technology delivery that determines whether it's off the shelf or in-house, how do you marry and have good governance through that process? Dave, why don't you kick off on that one? Well, I guess if we come from Uranus, then um, <laughs> uh, it, it's very difficult because... Uh, when, when we're involved in, in developments for customers, one of the most difficult things to actually achieve is a consistent specification of what's going to be delivered, you know, that, that actually gives you a price that you can mutually work to. And so, you know, the risk is scope creep, you know, people not necessarily changing their minds, but actually understanding as something gets developed, you know, that, that they think, mm, maybe that wasn't the right way to do it. So, you know, as a vendor, do we put a massive contingency into the initial quote uh, to cover that and, uh, and offer some kind of fixed price? Does it go yeah. time and materials and pass the entire risk over to the customer? That's a really difficult thing. Um, I've never yet worked on one project where the spec is, is absolutely perfect and, and is never deviated from. Never. You know, there's always some, some degree of that. And, you know, balancing that risk and, and understanding how you're going to manage that between the customer and, and, and the vendor is one of the tricks to a successful project. Because if you don't do that, you can get massive bad feeling on, on, on either side. You know, either that's the why the offshore feels they're being, being yeah, ripped but off. I think that's why the offshore development shops, particularly the Indian de development houses, have done so well. Because yeah. they're very good at managing that phase process. Yeah, yeah. But there's a huge problem with communication of, of changing... Yeah. Changing scopes through projects. Yeah, but that's that's similar to people uh, on 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 the retail side on on banking. They're they're hesitant to work on a I pay for good advice model. Uh, I mean, you know, if you if you go to banks, they expect okay, I, I talk to my bank manager and he tells me what I should invest in, and he has my best interest in mind. Yeah. Whereas the bank manager, of course, says okay, what product can I sell the customer to get the most uh, kickback from? You know, sort of like the issuing uh, bank or or a securities firm, mm. and where I can, can I maximize my bonus? So that's different information. So if they will go and say, okay, here, I pay you 200 pounds, and you basically give me objective advice what I should do and how should I do it, 
uh, would work better. And I think that's something that might be a solution out of that, saying, well, okay, before you actually do a project, not do a you know lengthy, expensive product study, but at least spend some money on saying, okay, here we really specify to the best of our knowledge, mutual knowledge, exactly what it will be, rather than you know just doing a quick spec, a quick contract, and then hoping, okay, we didn't forget anything, and in the end getting a big surprise that you know yeah. uh, the vendor understood something completely different than the, the customer, and in the end it doesn't match, and then you know it's a big discussion who's going to pick up the tab. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe saying, okay, here's a certain amount that we set aside, and that's just for planning and, and basically spe specking things, mm. so that we really have a, a reasonable chance of you know, hitting that target by plus minus X yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah, and I think Dave would agree with me that the, the place to mm -hmm. save the money is in that initial requirement. Because yeah. when you do nail that, and you never nail it completely, there's always some change along the way. Mm. You're absolutely right there. But if you can nail that as much as possible, you yeah. save the maximum amount because that's the place to save the money. Yeah, and I think your point about bells and whistles is very important because when you are defining a project, again, it's very easy to... The 80-20 rule, you know, it's very easy to lay down the, the 80%. Do the 20% that's remaining become bells and whistles? You know, do they become the less important things? Or are they the real things that actually give you differentiation because the rest of it is a bulk yeah. commodity thing just to deliver a platform? So, you know, that's a really difficult thing as well. And, and, and um, you know, where you actually say, is that really essential? You know, do you really want that? Do you want it to be green or blue? You know, um, you know. For you, that might be something fundamentally important in the way that you recognise it. But doesn't it all yeah. come back to good IT governance, good corporate governance, you know, ha having the right people s steering these projects and steering the overall yeah. architecture? Yeah, but then again, you need, you need someone with that experience saying, OK, I've actually done two or three IT projects and I've actually seen the results, you know, if you do proper planning, if you don't do proper planning, because that makes a huge difference in the, in the, in the well, outcome. Do you, do you see that as one person, Peter? I, I saw that as a mixture of a committee, so to speak, plus obviously a, yeah. a leader of the committee. I don't know. Com committees is always a bit tricky. I mean, if it's like it's a small committee, maybe, but, you know, there's too many people, then it, get, it gets tricky because then, you know, everybody has their own agenda and, you know, then it's difficult to agree and then, you know, there's politics coming into it and people saying, okay, this is important, whereas really it isn't so much, but it's their pet project and so you'd agree I'm, with I'm, 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 I'm more a fan of, of less people but with a higher level of knowledge and, and expertise and involvement. I you'd agree with the old quote better. that the best committee is made of three people, two of whom are missing? Possibly. <laughs> no, I, would, I would say like, you know, two, I mean, it's always helpful to have some sanity checking in terms of you have some feedback from somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a Lone Ranger type thing. I'm not sure if that's the ideal situation, but that's why I'm saying, you know, if you have someone in the company who is, who has that experience level, or you hire someone as an external advisor who has that knowledge, and then you have a high level uh, supplier, um, a high, high level person from the supplier, and those two sit together, I think they can thresh out a pretty, you know, good mm. specification, yeah. a, a pretty good target, a pretty good timeline, a pretty good budget that probably, you know, will be realistic. So I don't think you need really more than that. I mean, you don't need like five guys on your side and then five guys on the vendor side. I think that really doesn't lead to... No, I think it also gets into what you're saying, Paul, which is that you know, a good supplier relationship moves from where it's commodity and therefore you're just buying stuff off the shelf mm -hmm. to where you're needing something that's going to differentiate and be strategically intensive for the operation, which therefore needs a trusted advisor, yep. which is far more of a relationship partnership than just someone who's supplying you commodity goods. Absolutely, and the yeah. partnership should actually be a three-way partnership, and, and, and I agree mm. with you. It's, it, it's actually three. It's the business. It's somebody independent. Mm. but with the experience and the specialism in that particular domain area. Mm. And it's, in this case, a product vendor, this one, but perhaps it might be the internal team who do the development for you. It can be yeah, either. Yeah, sure. It doesn't actually matter which one, but it's those three that will actually drive it with, with a potential for success. Yeah, I think that's, that's the easiest way. I mean, if you can organise that, uh, a lot of times... I guess it's difficult to find all those three people but yeah. in the right positions. But I and think that's, while I'm that's thinking about decision. it, if you are going to the supermarket mm -hmm. and you want to drive a Lamborghini, if you want to drop a card in our stand, <laughs> we're offering a prize of a... Um, Lamborghini? Uh, not a Lamborghini, <laughs> but a driving one, potentially. Okay. Mm -hmm. On that plug, let's right. see if there's any questions from the audience <laughs> floor before we get into uh, any other discussions from the panel. Yes, there's a gentleman at the corner down here who's got a question. The microphone is on its way. First thing is relates to uh, the, the topics on the board. 
and um, you know, fast and reliable and long term and low cost and consistent. Right? So there's 14 different paradox terms all in one sentence. Yeah. And I would propose to you that the more moving parts there are in that system in terms of vendors and products, there's a direct correlation between that and <coughs> how unlikely you are to achieve those things. That's my first a complex system with lots and lots of moving parts, got lots of interfaces, lots of things to go wrong, impossible to optimize, and won't achieve those things. The second thing is uh, tangential to that, but it's on a subject which you did discuss, um, and that's that we mentioned build versus buy and strategic um, technologies. So uh, I don't think that you mentioned it, I would like to mention it, is the idea that. Um, uh, strategic to me means are we going to reuse it? So if we're going to build it once, we don't need an install program, we don't need to make it cross platform, we don't need all the bells and whistles, we just need to build in a minimal level of functionality for it to achieve what it needs to achieve. We do that one thing. If I'm going to use it lots of time, it needs to be skilled up, I buy a strategic technology and I probably should buy that from a vendor who is able to support me strategically. There's lots of people out there who know how to use that technology, etc. 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 I would say that the correct thing is strategy, strategic technology, but the definition of that is how often I how often am I going to use Well let's start with the your latter point and see if everyone agrees. Is strategic purely because it's going to be reused and it's got long term embedding in the organization? Yeah, I would definitely agree to that definition. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it depends what you're doing. I mean, you still need to make sure that the stuff that you only use once or that you only use for a limited period of time, sometimes that's still very critical. So on that stuff, you know, let's say if it's in high frequency trading, you know, if you have something that just goes crazy and doesn't do what it's supposed to do, it can be very expensive. Even you just use it once and then you definitely use it only once because then you don't exist anymore after that. Uh, so you know, that becomes strategic in, in, in a sense as well. So I guess that's just something you have to keep in mind. But in principle, I, I completely agree to, to that approach. But then I, again, the stuff that, you know, you're not going to use long term, that's, that's really stuff where, you know, cost and, and value for money matters a lot because then you can uh, accumulate a lot of stuff and buy it over the years and throw it away every year or every six months uh, and, and then renting that, sharing the cost on things like that that are just utility. I think that's really a huge benefit on sharing the cost with somebody. And uh, I think you have so much industrialization going on in trading and finance um, that really that's something that people should really look into more. Uh, and there's still a lot of paranoia in terms of outsourcing and you know having other people do things. Uh, but even core technology, things that you use longer term. You know, if you have a partner that you know has longevity that you know you know will be there uh, to support you and help you. Why, why not go to, to an outside party? Um, I, I think it's interesting, really, because I think the point that you were getting at, Ian, is that, that you know, it, the number of moving parts in a project, can a single vendor actually provide you know, all, the, all the moving parts and therefore reduce the, the risk? You know, I would say maybe Oracle can. Um, you know, but, but, but then you, know, you come down to the specialization and, and, and you know, I guess, uh, I guess how specialist can a large vendor be in some of the really detailed areas? And, now there's that, and that's, a, that's a, a kind of a balance. And you know, in, in my view, the, you know, the, the risk of, of putting everything through a prime contractor, um, you know, so the prime contractor becomes responsible for the successful delivery of that project, um, you know, even in, maybe down to the, to the financial risk as mm -hmm. well, um, can be a great way of actually driving a, a project forward because their only incentive is to deliver it on time, on budget, you know, and make of the margin course. that they originally planned. So it does bring that, force that element of project management in. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think yeah, it's I think, important for this. I think well, one, one key area, especially in larger organizations, is uh, that front office technology. Usually, you know, people go around and say, okay, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want? Okay, you're a head trader, you make, I don't know, 50 million for us. Okay, you, could, you can choose whatever you want. And I think that's a lot of times an issue in bigger organizations that everybody gets their, 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 their wish. Uh, basically, you know, everybody can pick their own system, they can pick their own infrastructure, and there's, there's too little general organization, uh, general planning on saying, well, okay, you know, what I, 
like you said, well, what are actually your requirements? You know, it's very rarely that someone actually gets an outside party and says, okay, let's sit with all the guys that have all those wish lists and say, okay, behind the wish list, what is actually the requirement? Okay, here's one thing that can do 70% of it, and they have three outside, you know, supplier support organizations that can build the other 30%, and then you have a consolidated system, then you have an integrated platform, and that'll probably save you, you know, seven, eight, eight figure numbers. Uh, but for that, most of the time, you really need someone that sits down with the different interested parties and says, okay, you know, here's your wish list, nice and well, but actually, what are your requirements beyond that wish list and behind that wish list? Uh, and now let's see, you know, what actually we need to deliver and who can deliver that. And yeah, then the, that, question, that's, that's, the question is not what do you want. The question is what are we going to achieve? What, what's the final result? What's, what's the requirement? If you get that question right, you're a long way towards your objective. Yeah, you keep coming back to that, Paul, but the problem most companies have is that they don't actually know what they want to achieve <laughs> because they don't know what the final end point is. They, no, they, what they, they, they know, know is they, they know have... what they want to achieve. They want to make a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. That, 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 that's their final objective, but there's some steps along the way there that enable them to do that. They want to get in front of the competition. They want to be able to trade faster. Um, they want to be able to trade in new markets. They want to uh, create a new instrument. It, there's many, many things that lead to that final, this is what I want to achieve. Yeah, I take a slightly different tack on that one in some ways, and that if you look at most of the uh, investment institutions that I've dealt with, it tends to be that when they see someone doing something that's getting yeah. alpha and profit and differentiation, they say, I want some of that, and yes. write, write a blank check. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And it's totally tactical, isn't it? there's no strategic intent at all, it's just get me there. Yes, get me there, and then you analyze how to get there, and that becomes the requirement. Get me there is the overall requirement. Mm. Yeah? It, it doesn't matter whether that's technical or strategic. If it's strategic, there's the possibility that you end up with something with multiple moving parts. If it's totally tactical, it might be something very simple and straightforward. But you need to define from it the actual requirement to get you there. Yeah, I also still see it slightly different in terms of not just, you know, how to get me there because, no, I mean, at that point, nobody questions actually, should we get there? And <laughs> I think that's, that's the initial question you have to that's, ask, that's you know, should, one, should, yes. should, should we actually get there? And, you know, then the next question is, okay, what is actually benefit of being there? Or, you know, if yeah. they are there, yeah. you know, what would be the logical next? I mean, the more interesting part for me would be to say, okay, if someone is there, you know, do I want to get there or do I actually want to get where they get to next and, you know, what's the next step? And I think that's what you see a lot of times in technology now, that people are moving a certain path. You know, like mm -hmm. if you look at exchanges, uh, you know, they upgrade their infrastructure and they're saying, okay, now we got the fastest exchange in the world. Okay, well, funny enough, the members that you have already traded 10 times, 100 times the speed that you can actually handle trades because they're already like one, two steps ahead. Mm -hmm. So the question would not be, okay, how do I match the fastest exchange in the world, or how do I be a little bit faster, but okay, where they will go next? And then, okay, if, they, if that's where they go next, does that actually make sense? And what's the best and cheapest and most effective way of going there? And I think that's, that's a key question you need but to going ask. Back, going back to your 50 million a year trader, too often you know, the back office is too frightened to ask those questions in rigorous yeah. depth to stop that process. So it actually it just happens by osmosis. Yeah, but that's, I don't think that's to do with technology. I mean, that's just, you know, as, as, as long as a business is running and people make money, don't ask any questions, you know, yeah. don't, disrupt, don't disrupt the flow. And then, but that's, that's a different topic, I think. <laughs> Slightly different. different. Was there any other questions or th points? Yeah, there's a couple more here. There's a mic microphone to this question? Yeah. Uh, Uh, what are the panel's thoughts on, um, as you go through the process of getting the advisors, those advisors, and uh, looking at uh, substitution and obsolescence of various aspects, should that be a day one thing? Or should that be to go through the process and this then slants the whole thing? But why did you tell you to choose the panel group that you want to have? Obsolescence, Dave. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting one because one of the things that we see, certainly in, in the front office environment, is a very short-lived um, uh, lifespan of, of applications in, in a lot of cases. 
So obsolescence in, in, the, in the technical sense often doesn't come into it. it. It becomes obsolete from a business perspective, often before the technology becomes obsolete. However, as you move into middle and back office, then that actually does become, become more of an issue. Um, you know, I guess, I guess the answer has to be that, that the technologies that you buy into have to have, to have a roadmap. They have to have you know, a development path. They have to, the vendors have to prove that, that uh, you know, they're not going up some blind alley, which is weird and wonderful and great for, for two or five years. Um, so, so I wasn't just about that. I think you came back to the, uh, the basic uh, discussion of the kind of mission, uh, which is to set up your government something, um, where we talk about external advisors, talk about people in government. Um, as you are defining the process of which we are sort of saying that the most important aspect of it, you are actually defining the business saying where it all fits together. But as you fit that business model together, um, do you, uh, do you, should you identify the stuff, what you actually substitute at what point? Well, I think you definitely have to. This matches. This then naturally comes out of technology is only one aspect of it. It's the way you do it. It's the way you sort of go. Are you sort of stay static with that model for the first year, second year, third year? Or do you have sort of like segments and schedule where you have some class? You start off with currency trading first, and then you know, the next year, a year later, you want to get revenue trading, year after, you want to do just a group or something like that. Well, I guess it's. Definitely one of the key things to have a big picture. I mean, a lot of organizations don't really work without a big or work without a big picture because they only improve incrementally and basically just fix holes and basically do the next thing that absolutely is necessary. Uh, and that, but that is coordination that you need at the top level. Saying, okay, fine, you know, what, what's really the goal? It's like the stupid question. You know, you go for an interview uh, as a student. You know, where you want to be in, you know, one year, three year, five year, ten year. Uh, most organizations can't really answer that. There's nobody there really saying, okay, where are we actually going? It's very difficult because of where the, the world is changing. Uh, and I guess the, the, the solution to that, or in terms of avoiding obsolescence, is you know, realizing that and saying, okay, fine, you, know, you have to structure things. Ideally, the core components that are expensive to stay with you for a long time to have them flexible because your business model might change, your plans might change. You know, maybe you know, now you're saying next year we're going to do FX and the year after fixed income. Maybe next year you're going to do commodities, and the year after you're going to do um, whatever, whether real estate derivatives, because that's the flavor of the year. Um, but a lot of the technology is is very versatile. You know, if you, I think if you build it correctly, and if you get the proper advice, you can build technology to be very flexible. You know, in terms of asset class, in terms of business models, and and that's again where a lot of people don't really want to spend the money or the time to actually think about us and saying, okay. How do we build something that is versatile and helps us to, you know, be sustainable uh, without having a lot of obsolescence, uh, obsolescence uh, along the way? And I think that's that's definitely important. Yeah. Speaking. What? Oh, sorry. sorry. No, but, but speaking as somebody who predates um, vast amounts of technology that we have nowadays, like calculators and uh, digital watches, um, you can't second guess technology. You can have no idea where it's going next. Not, not with any guaranteed idea of where it's going. What you can do is you can plan tactically or strategically. Uh, and it comes back to that point. And part of your strategy should say something may happen that's completely off the wall. And there is the potential within technology, certainly in my experience, and like one TV channel, and that was black and white and shut at 11 o'clock at night, um, you don't know what's coming next. You can't absolutely plan for it, but you can put something into your plan to say, the unexpected may well come along. I think that's really difficult to plan for. I, I think you know, what, uh, there is a very clear roadmap in, in, in terms of at least a, th a three year window of technologies that are in place right now. You can't, you can't, you can't plan for something we don't know whether it's gonna appear or not. Um, but, uh, but certainly, you know, as a vendor, we've got a very clear picture of, of, of how our technology will develop over three years. I think one of the, the, the interesting takes on obsolescence that I've experienced in the past is where the people that specify and originally develop the application have kind of all moved on. And in the case of my old you know, IBM days where they were, they, we had calls from customers using mainframes, and they said, look, 
these guys are actually disappearing faster than we recruit, can recruit for the mainframe. We've got no way of supporting this stuff going forward. That's a huge business risk. So the obsolescence mm -hmm. doesn't actually come from a technology point of view, but purely from a skills uh, uh, continuity perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a real difficult one to plan around. You know? I, I, I think to follow up on that, I think what you will see, and uh, you know if you like it or not, I think going forward you will only be competitive sort of like if you if you use a huge degree of outsourcing and, and external parties because the, the the cost of building in a cottage industry everything yourself is just completely prohibitive and it's going to be prohibitive. it's like the same you want to be competitive today in in manufacturing cars i mean if you build the car yourself in in your garden shed with your friends i mean you're never going to produce a, a car that you can sell in amounts that are competitive and where you get volume okay maybe you can build a, a one-off you can sell for a million or two if you're lucky, but there's no guarantee for that. But if you want to be competitive with the general market, I mean, you have to have a factory where you build things, where you have suppliers, where you, where you get things in, and where a lot of your skill is, is the connectivity, how you put things together. And I think that there will be a huge shift in terms of knowledge, not building stuff, but basically putting things together and, and putting things together or planning on putting things together in a way that, you know, you have planned obsolescence that you can replace things without everything falling apart. And that's a skill that will be in very high demand going forward on the outsourcing side, not knowing how to build things, but how to, how to put things together in a way that, you know, you can exchange things and, and, you know, that you have a dynamic system that doesn't fall apart if you just pull one straw uh, out of the stack. Uh, and I think that that is something that is, is really unavoidable. So, you know, still planning on building everything yourself is just not going to happen. Uh, you know, if you talk to a lot of the, the high-end market makers, high-frequency trading firms, I mean, five years ago, they, what, seven years ago, they said, okay, I can show you, I have to shoot you. Um, that's, that's completely gone. A lot of them are very happy, not openly, not, you know, in the newspaper, but, you know, to go and say, okay, fine, this is just getting too expensive, too ridiculous for us. You know, the only way we can keep up with the competition is to say, okay, whatever we can get somewhere else at a cost-sharing basis, we do, uh, and then the other stuff we did, we, we build ourselves. And I think that's, that's completely unavoidable if, if people like it or not, so. Uh, we need to draw to a conclusion because yeah. uh, the panel's time run out, has run out. So I guess a final comment very briefly from each of you on how do you take the risk out of the technology projects going wrong? You know, I'm coming back to governance again, but you know, we talked about tactical versus strategic, build versus buy, you know, low cost, resilient, reliable and obsolescence. How do you actually just make sure this stuff is not going to screw up your operation? Um, I wish there was a silver bullet. If there was, we wouldn't constantly get it wrong, as, as often seems to be the case. Um, but but I, I guess it does come down to, to just putting enough thought up front uh, and planning enough up front to make sure that you understand what your objectives are, you know, how you're going to deliver those objectives, and, uh, and how you're going to measure that. You know, because if, if you don't have a way of measuring it to decide whether you've, you've achieved your objective, then you know, that makes life very difficult. Um, and then I think you know, once the thing's live, keeping an open mind in terms of its evolution you know, and, and not saying that that's the end of our investment in that product, you know, actually having, having uh, the view that it will evolve and we will want more, more uh, enhancements or whatever as business requirements change. Um, so just keeping an open mind with that. And, 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 and then finally, from, from my point of view, is continuity, ensuring that there is still continuity either in, in, in your organization or in the vendor's organization that can, that can manage that, that product going forward. Paul? Yeah, I don't, don't disagree with anything there. Um, it starts with the objective and the requirements. You need a rigorous change process to ensure that you capture what you need to change and, and deliver on that. And then it's once you achieve the quality you need and you're operational, it's the lessons learned. Uh, not only about the process itself, but what you learn from the actual operation, because I've yet to see uh, a system used in the way that it was originally designed because users being what they are they will always find a different way you should <laughs> use that experience in your next iteration yeah I, I think the key thing is to to understand technology to a point that you know what is actually the benefit of it uh, what's the value of it um, and then basically you know building or you know getting that knowledge how to integrate and put things together because that's really where things you know periodically fall apart that, you know, you might have great products, you might have great services, but, you know, nobody knows how to really put them together that, you know, you have continuity and that, uh, you know, you have an integrated uh, structure that really works. So I think that's, that's really the key aspects I think that people should focus on. Thank you very much. And on that note, Thanks. Dave.
Paul and Peter, thank you for your contribution.